All right. So hi again. So reviewing it together, we agree now that we have first heart sound, second heart sound, third heart sound. Let's just make this here. And first heart sound is the closure of the AV valves. Second heart sound is the closure of the semilunar valves. And the third heart sound is the passive passage of the blood from the atria to the ventricles. Uh, that is the rapid filling, we call. And four is the atrial systole producing to us additional 20% of so that goes into the ventricles and that produce this faint sound which is known as the fourth heart sound. Remember that the third heart sound and the fourth heart sound, you don't usually hear them. Okay, so we're good. We're going to start now, like I said, with the mitral valve. So we agreed that the blood is going passively from the atria to the ventricle. But when is that happening? So we need to draw that in order for us to appreciate, right? So we agreed that the second heart sound, which is the closure of this valve and that valve, we're going to focus on the left now. There is no reason for us to confuse ourselves with events for now, events that are going on the right side. So the second heart sound is the closure of here, the aortic valve, right? And But then there will be a gap, right? And during this gap, nothing really is happening. No filling is happening from um, the atria. And of course, we should not expect any blood to come back from ventricles, right? So at this point here, the ventricular volume, right? At this point, we're going to try to draw the ventricular volume here. Ventricular volume is staying even, right? And if you remember, we call that isovolumetric relaxation phase, right? At which lasts from the closing of the semilunar valves to the opening of the mitral valves, right? So nothing happened. This is volume here, right? This is ventricular volume. VV is ventricular volume, right? And then the volume starts to pick up, and that is passive phenomena, and that is just because of the blood passing from the area of high blood pressure to the area of low blood pressure. And then with the atrial contraction, we will have additional about 20% or so of blood that will go through and that produces our fourth heart sound. We agreed to this, right? So before the filling, right, you shouldn't expect any voice happening. So you know another you know, a sound rather. So in other words, you shouldn't expect any murmur between what used to be the second heart sound and the third heart sound in this case. In this case, it, there should, you shouldn't expect anything, right? So, but that means in the early diastole, because this is the early diastole, right? This is the early diastole. You shouldn't be expecting any sound at all if the problem here is with this valve being, uh, let's say, unable to open, right? Because normally no blood is going to come from the atria to the ventricle at that point, right? So let's describe a situation here where the mitral valve is slightly tense than normal, right? So it has fibrosis. I'm going to put that in gray here. And so that will prevent the valve from opening properly, right? And what that will do to the flow of the blood is that it will mm, allow the blood to go in every direction instead of passing very smoothly from the, the atria to the ventricles. Instead, the blood is going into every direction. And therefore, because it's passing through this narrow hole, and therefore, it's going to produce to us some abnormal vibration, which will be reflected as murmur. But when did that murmur happen? Well, it happened after the pressure inside the ventricles uh, went down to below the pressure inside the atria, right? Because that's the flow from the atria to the ventricles. So you would expect the murmur, and I'm going to try to pick a different color here for the murmur, and so you expect the murmur to start kicking somewhere around here to start to have some sound that will continue 
all the way, right? I'm going to just keep going all the way till you get to the first heart sound. And because at the first heart sound, then the valve is closed and there isn't much blood flowing anymore and the blood obviously is going to go it's not going to go back unless this valve doesn't clo close either which can happen that you have combined <coughs> valve problem that doesn't open fully but it doesn't close either so that that is a possibility so what i'm trying to tell you is that in case of atrial i'm sorry mitral stenosis in case of mitral stenosis you will have the kind of murmur that will be initiated not early in the diastole because remember the pressure inside the ventricles has to drop the left ventricle has to drop to below the pressure inside the left atrium right and so in the early diastole don't expect any sound to start to occur but you start to expect the sound to happen once the pressure falls down and the blood actually starts flowing, especially when it's aided by the contraction of the atria, because that will try to squeeze the blood against that tight space and therefore producing even more of, um, of the murmurs, right? All the way to the first heart sound. And the third heart sound, uh, it would be primarily uh, the tricuspid valve, and you will see that there is a diminished component on the mitral. The mitral valve will be slightly diminished. And you will hear, that means the heart sound, you will hear better, the first heart sound, you will hear it better on uh, the tricuspid than on the mitral component. And if you remember the mitral component, you listen to it at the apex, which is in the fifth intercostal space in the midclavicular line, whereas um, the, the, the tricuspid component, you're listening around the, the zyphy sternum, the xiphoid process of the sternum, uh, slightly to the left. And so um, you will, if you put the stethoscope here next to the uh, xiphoid process, you will hear a much better first heart sound than what you will hear if you place the stethoscope around the apex. Um, which uh, is where the fifth intercostal space is in the midclavicular line. Okay, so that is just as uh, we describe the sounds, right? Not the complications, not what that means, but just the sound, right? What that produces to you is mid to late diastolic murmur, mid to late diastolic murmur, and um, but not systolic, right? Because the blood is not supposed to go back, right? Remember that the systolic murmur will be only produced if the blood goes through that particular passage while the ventricles are contracting. Sounds good? Okay. So let's talk about what kind of complications should we expect. Well, okay, so let's draw this here in a smaller scale. So here we have atria and we have ventricles, right? And so the blood, which is supposed to go from the left atrium to the left ventricle, is now blocked. Therefore, the pressure inside the left atrium is going to start to build up, right? Because you're not able to squeeze the blood as you should into the left ventricle, right? And that will result in accumulating the blood back into the lungs, right? So now the lungs will have edema, it will have pulmonary hypertension, the blood is not going out easily from the lungs. Why is that? Well, because the lungs are draining in the pulmonary veins and the pulmonary veins now will face a higher than normal pressure inside the atria and that will result in pulmonary hypertension. But wait a second, if we have a pulmonary hypertension, then that will mean the left ventricle, which is supposed to empty the blood through the pulmonary artery, into there is not going to work as efficiently right and so that will mean the pressure inside the right ventricle is going to build up as well if the pressure inside the right ventricle is going to build up then you would expect the pressure inside the right atrium also will start picking up well if the pressure inside the right atrium is building up 
then the pressure in the superior and inferior vena cava is also building up. Superior vena cava that can be manifested by looking at the jugular vein. You will see that the jugular vein is distended and pulsating. Uh, inferior vena cava, all the problem that uh, are all the problems that are associated with increased pressure there. So you will have extremities, uh, lower extremities edema. The feet are get swelling. Um, sometimes you have ascites if it starts to translate into portal hypertension, and you will have um, hepatomegaly if that also is um, uh, can result in portal hypertension, splenomegaly, all the problems that we would expect with increased pressure inside the uh, right ventricle, right? Then so, or all the problems that are attributed or associated with the right ventricular failure, right? And so what I'm trying to tell you is a problem here all the way started over here, right? In the mitral valve. The only problem with this uh, patient here was that the mitral valve was not opening fully, resulting in higher pressure in the, in, in the left atrium that resulted in higher pressure inside the lungs, that resulted in higher pressure inside the right ventricle, and that resulted in higher pressure inside the right atrium, which resulted in higher pressure inside um, the superior and inferior vena cava, which can translate into all the veins, right? So, what that translated into is also with the sounds that we will hear a diastolic murmur, not early, mid to late diastolic murmur, and it will end up with the first heart sound. That what we have. It's sharp sound because it's going through a narrow passage, not as sharp, not as elevated, sharp, um, very strong sound that you would expect from um, from the semilunar uh, valve being uh, stenosed because of course the pressure that is being produced by the ventricles is much more than the pressure that will ever come from the atria. So you don't expect the same level of noise uh, to be coming with a stream coming from the atria compared to that compare that to stream noise coming from the ventricles just because of the difference in the pressure you would expect the stream is making stronger vibration when it's coming from the ventricles sounds good so this is our first case here which is our mitral stenosis right mitral stenosis and so let's stay with the mitral valve before we make another yet another um, video and so in, in mitral incompetence, however, so this was mitral stenosis, right? So allow me here to erase some of what I just draw to you. And then we will go into mitral incompetence instead. So in mitral incompetence, now you have the valve being wide open, right? So you have the valve now being wide open all the way not totally all the way, but it fails to close. And sometimes when it closes and then it slips to the other side because the cordy tendini and the papillary muscles are not holding it right, then you may even hear something called a click. And so it tries to close and then it, it prolapses to the other side. We're not gonna go into much details of that, but let's just describe the situation here. If we have um, a problem with the, the mitral valve not being able to close fully. Okay, so when the blood is coming from the atria to the ventricles, that shouldn't be a problem. So during the diastole, you shouldn't expect really noise to happen except in very late in the disease, very late in the complication, but that's a different story. But in, in, in a mild uh, a prolapse, in mild incompetence, you don't expect much of noise happening here uh, by the passage of normal amount, semi-normal amount of blood. I say that because if the blood start to be a lot inside the atrium and then we'll try to go back uh, into the uh, left ventricle through the mitral valve, uh, that alone can also produce to you some sound, but just because of increased amount of the blood 
not necessarily because of a problem in the family itself. But that's a different story. So let's stay just with the incompetence for now, the prolapse. What happens is the blood went from the atria to the ventricles. No problem. We're staying with the left. Then the ventricle will contract, right? And that would increase the pressure inside, inside the left ventricle, right? And as the pressure is rising, we agreed that, that this valve will close, right? But, but that pressure will also allow some of the blood, not much, but some of the blood to start exiting through the valve. Remember that this valve is not gonna be that wide open. It's just gonna start leaking back into the atrium, the left atrium. And so that will result in the blood as the as the ventricle, the left ventricle is contracting, this is closed, no problem, because we don't have valvular disease here unless you have a problem with both the aortic and the mitral valve, which is not uncommon, it happens, right? But we are talking about a defect that is here that will allow the blood to go back into the atrium when it wasn't supposed to happen, right? Good. So when is that blood going into the atrium? Well, it went th during the systole, during the contraction of the ventricle. So you really would expect, you really would expect that to be immediately, immediately after the first heart sound, right? Because the first heart sound is indicative of the increased pressure inside the, the ventricle. So you will expect that kind of defect to produce to you a faint sound that will continue throughout all the way to the second heart sound, right? All the way through to the second heart sound until the pressure inside the ventricle drop all the way down and then the new filling will come in, right? So in aortic incompetence, in aortic incompetence, you will expect the the sound, the murmur, this is the murmur that is being produced, to be between the first and the second heart sound, right? Almost completely the entire length between the first and the heart sound, and second, second heart sound, but it's gonna be a soft murmur. Anytime you have incompetence, you would expect the murmur to be soft murmur. Sounds good? Okay. Blood pressure inside here, as long as the heart is able to compensate, then you shouldn't expect a great drop. So it maybe will be around 100 and 10 hundred, and the diastole will be 60 or 70, right? But you don't expect major problem with that. The problem is the backing up of the blood. So we agreed, first of all, when would you expect the murmur? The murmur in this case, is a pan-systolic murmur and which happens throughout the systole and that's due to the blood vibrating the atrium as the blood is going into the opposite direction. Keep in mind please, that it's not like the two chambers become one, it's not like the pressure inside the atrium is going to be 120, that of course doesn't happen, it's all of it is is that it doesn't close completely and therefore there is a tiny defect here through which the blood is capable of rushing back into the atrium. Sounds good? Okay. So as the blood has rushed in the atrium, into the atrium, it's gonna start meeting with the blood that is coming from the lungs. So like we did last time, if we are to draw this, and so we are having, um, I'm running out of space here, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna delete the, the murmur here. Um, so we agreed that here is ventricle, here is atrium, atrium, ventricle, and ventricle, right? Okay. So we agreed that the blood is going to come back from the ventricle to the atrium. That is going to be meeting the other blood that is also coming from the lungs, the pulmonary circulation, to the left atrium. So the blood here that is coming this way is going to start to have trouble right passing into the atrium because the pressure inside the atrium will rise now you have accumulation of blood right accumulation of blood like we studied before already uh, will cause accumulation of blood and increased pressure inside the lungs right 
and the increased pressure inside the lungs, which we call pulmonary hypertension, will increase the pressure inside the right ventricle. And increased pressure inside the right ventricle will increase the pressure inside the right atrium. And that will also lead to the increased pressure in the superior and inferior vena cava, right? Okay. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that uh, we call that in the class, if you remember, plumbingology. That means things that will start backing up. And so if it backs up here in the lungs, you will start to see the person is coughing blood and has problem breathing. If it starts backing into the right ventricle and the right atrium, you will see uh, problems that are associated with um, congestion, congestive heart failure. And so you will see, start to see pulsating jugulars, you will start to see swelling lower limbs, uh, the venous circulation is dilated, and if it goes to the portal hypertension, you will see the problems that are attributed to portal hypertension. Portal hypertension is the blood circulation around the liver and all the veins that drains uh, through the portal vein. Sounds good? Okay. So what I want you to remember what I want you to realize is that the noise is exaggeration of the passage right the passage in this case is not so was not supposed to go into the atrium vibration of the atrium is going to produce to you noise uh, when is the noise happening in this case it's during the contraction of the ventricle because it's during the contraction of the ventricle that the pressure inside the ventricles will exceed the pressure inside the atria so you or left we're talking about the left side here and so you would expect this kind of noise to be a soft noise between the first and the second heart sound sounds good but if you remember the previous one where we had stenosis and because the stenosis this allowed the blood to go from the left atrium to the left ventricle right and so the blood had problems um, passing through a narrow space. So it was during the filling of the atrium, and remember that the filling is happening in mid to late diastole, during the filling of the ventricles, you will start to hear that murmur, right? Which is coming from the mitral stenosis. Sounds good. And the complications we talked about them, which is essentially back up, back up, back up, back up, back up, until it shows into the veins and the capillary circulation. Sounds good? All right. So these were problems that are attributed to uh, mitral valve. Uh, where would you be listening to those problems? Well, wherever you have uh, the, first and the first heart sound component would be. Um, um, when it comes to the first, the, 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 the mitral stenosis. So you will have the mitral stenosis will produce you a murmur that is best felt at the apex of the heart, more or less at the apex of the heart. Uh, but there is also the mitral incompetence. You can hear that uh, around what they call herb spot, which is the third uh, intercostal uh, uh, space next to the sternum, parasternal. Um, you don't have to remember that, but there are certain spots in, uh, on the chest that you will hear uh, those better than others, right? And so just wanted you to understand what's a systolic murmur, what is a diastolic murmur. If the murmur is strong enough, and you will see that when we get into um, the aortic stenosis, for example, then it will produce to you vibration that you can even feel with your bare hand. And then we will call that a thrill, right? Not just a murmur. A murmur is something you hear. But if you start to feel that murmur or feel that noise, we call that a thrill. Sounds good? So these are problems that um, are attributed to mitral valve. We described mitral valve stenosis and mitral valve incompetence. So in the next video, we'll talk about the aortic valve, problems that can happen at that level. We'll also talk about both aortic stenosis and aortic incompetence. And let's see what we have, what we have there.